Electric vehicles, or EVs, are becoming more and more popular in the United States. The state of California is far ahead, with over 40% of zero emission vehicle sales in the country. And with rapid electrification of transportation on the horizon, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So, is California ready for mass EV adoption? Major challenges lie ahead for the state and its people. Stay tuned to find out why and what possible consequences this could have in the near future. EV adoption is expected to accelerate now that California has announced an end to traditional gas-powered car sales by 2035. But is the state ready for the upcoming EV rush? Will everyone be able to afford installing state-of-the-art chargers at home? Will the electricity grid and public charging infrastructure be able to handle the increased demand, particularly in urban areas such as downtown San Jose? To answer these questions, our research team was formed during Dr. Jen English Lewick's Anthropology Applications Core course at San Jose State University in partnership with Alliance Innovation Lab Silicon Valley and Eric St. Gray. We researched the current state of EV infrastructure, conducted interviews with EV users, and circulated web surveys to find out about people's experiences in the current EV ecosystem. We also examined people's reasons for adopting EVs or for sticking with conventional cars. We focused on the role being a homeowner or a tenant plays in EV adoption, and we also took a look at how historically protected landscapes affect charging station availability and accessibility. The current state of affairs leads us to believe that the burden of developing adequate infrastructure to meet EV users' needs is shifting and will continue to shift towards EV users. From the existing literature on EV charging behavior, we know a few key facts. EV users prefer to charge at home, and they prefer to do so during peak hours. People tend to refuel their EV immediately, rather than on empty as they would with a conventional vehicle. Range anxiety is one of the most frequently cited barriers to EV adoption, and there are a few other barriers to mention as well. The relatively high price of EVs and the insufficiency of presently available charging infrastructure are also often cited. To conduct our research, we deployed a preliminary survey across different social media platforms and EV clubs to gather participants in the Bay Area to interview for our project. In total, we had 29 respondents for our survey and interviewed nine people. Of those nine people, seven were homeowners and two were landlords. Unfortunately, we were unable to interview any renters for this project. Renters made up just 18% of our respondents, and none agreed to speak with us. However, additional online polling suggested that some concerns non-EV owners have towards the technology include the environmental impact of mining battery chemicals, the higher cost of EVs compared to conventional and gas-powered vehicles, insufficient range, and inadequate public charging. Because so many of our respondents were members of an EV enthusiast club, we weren't surprised that many told us first and foremost about the advantages of EV ownership. But, you know, I, um, I just appreciate them. And I've come to really, really like the, uh, the Model Y that I have. It's, uh, it's the best car I've ever owned, hands down, not even close. When we asked homeowners about the process of equipping their homes with EV charging, the variety of strategies used became clear. Live in a mobile home and service is only 50 amps to the, the the house so i thought um uh i i would get a, a 32 amp charger uh for for uh at home i had the um electrician install a 30 amp uh, breaker unfortunately um when it was charging the uh, breaker got really hot i, I guess the uh um, the uh, car was drawing more than uh, the 32, 30 amps that the breaker was uh, set for. 
Whatever. At home, at home, it's a super slow charger, so it could take up to three days to to charge up to two hundred and twenty three miles. Uh, that's why I have to go to um, a, a closest charging station when I don't reach my two hundred twenty three miles. Low charging speeds contribute directly to range anxiety, at least for Jennifer. That I can't just get up and go without checking to make sure I have enough miles to go. So, for example, if I want to go, like the other day, I um, was at a party. I was at the party on Saturday, and I was going to go visit my friend in Oakland, but I only had 40 miles in my uh, car, so I had to stop and put uh, electricity in, which took another 45 minutes. Other participants shared concerns with us about the availability and safety of public charging, especially in rural areas. And I remember there was one time I was driving down to San Diego and, and the car told me to stop at this one charger that was a little kind of iffy, it's, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, dark. But while I'm sitting there uh, waiting for my car to charge, I kind of walk out of the car and walk through the parking lot just to stretch my legs. And I see somebody running away from this store. And then next thing I see is fire which is kind what? of scary. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm wondering if that person might have caught, you know, caught, um, you know, started a fire there, kind of a sketchy and scary situation. So um, anyway, I, I think these charging stations need to be in safe locations. Despite us not speaking directly with any renters, many of our participants agreed on the potential difficulties for renters to have access to charging infrastructure. I talked to a lot of people who are at condos or apartments who were like, I'd love to have an EV, but you know, I don't have a garage to park in. I don't have a dedicated charging station. I think of what the charging stations at work were like, where we had, I don't know, 20 charging stations and 100 EV drivers, and just the ballet of, of who gets to charge when, and when you're done, you'd better move because someone else needs to come in. Just that, and it, do that with an apartment building where there's a perhaps a little less um, professional courtesy. I don't know how that solution, what the solution there will be for apartments and condos, but I hope people come up with a good one. Both landlords we spoke with seemed less than thrilled at the prospect of installing charging infrastructure at their property. I think a lot of landlords will sell their properties for the most money possible because they don't want to deal with the transition to inputting EV chargers. I personally don't want to deal with it. I don't think uh, much of the ban of gas cars in 2035. I think if things go down or become too much of a hassle, I'll just sell all my apartment complexes so I won't have to deal with it. Let it be someone else's issue. In downtown San Jose, public charging stations are not yet commonplace. Most are clustered in the dense downtown core and located inside privately owned parking structures where space must be paid for in addition to any charging fees. Outside the downtown core, EV charging stations like this one at Valley Fair Mall are becoming more common, but our participants were critical of their availability. It was low, running low on charge. They've got a dozen chargers, but only one of which is compatible with my Mitsubishi i -Mave. So I went there. There was a Lucid sitting there, uh, you know, great big fancy, uh, fancy car. And I looked at the gauge, it said 95%. And I said, oh, okay, I'll wait for them. Um, they'll be out soon. The car will be charged soon. Well, it turns out the not charging of a battery is non-linear. At the high state of charge, it's tapering off. And it takes forever to go from 95, 96, 97. Uh, the person that had it, this lady, she had evidently set it to 100%. It took seemingly forever to get to 100%, and she still didn't show up. I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs. It, it took over an hour of me sitting there twiddling my thumbs before I could finally plug my, my car in. The sparse distribution of public charging outside the downtown core is plainly visible in this map, which shows that residential areas typically have few or no charging stations available. In addition, areas of historically protected landscapes seem to coincide with an absence of public charging stations. On this map, the charging stations are represented by red cars, and historically protected areas are the various colored polygons. 
We'll share a link in the description so that you can go check this out yourself. 2035 may seem far away, but on the timescale of urban planning and changing social conventions, it's right around the corner. Today's mall charger growing pains are likely to snowball into more serious issues in the next few years if the current trajectory is maintained. One concern is that California's electricity grid is insufficient at present to power vast numbers of EVs. Will the state have to rely on fossil fuel to power its growing EV fleet? This would negate much of the environmental benefit of going electric. Increased reliance on solar, geothermal, and other renewable small-scale power sources may become inevitable. Another concern is equal access to charging infrastructure, especially in areas with less population density. We think one possible outcome is that conventional vehicles will continue to be used in these locations, and their price may even become inflated on the secondary market. That is, as long as conventional fuel for these vehicles is still available. On the whole, inadequate charging infrastructure stuck out as a major obstacle for the development of a truly functional EV ecosystem. Almost everyone we spoke to had something to say about unreliable or even unsafe public chargers. Stories about inadequate private charging gave us pause due to safety concerns and increased reliance on public chargers. The bottom line is that the burden of providing power and infrastructure for California's growing EV fleet is increasingly on the end user. Homeowners and even landlords will likely have little choice but to install high-powered EV charging stations and possibly even solar panels and home storage batteries in their properties. The state may have little choice but to incentivize these private efforts through costly subsidies.